Before we start, I figured I'd mention that my recording space is a bit different right now, so hopefully this voiceover is tolerable. Thanks for your understanding. Similar to my next video, which is going to be on Arkham Asylum, the Arkham series as a whole, and the current projects from WB Montreal and Rocksteady, this video was intended to be a critique of Watch Dogs 1. A divisive game whose sequel I enjoyed thoroughly, I've wanted to look at the original Watch Dogs for a long time. I got it free through the Epic Store ages ago, but I also knew the PC port wasn't the strongest, and I was sure my previous laptop couldn't run it well at respectable settings while capturing footage at the same time. But I also didn't want to buy the PS4 version and get a 30 frames per second experience when I already owned the game on a platform where I could get 60. Apparently, my current laptop can't run it particularly well either. Issues where the entire world's shadows start flickering in and out. Random performance drops that are consistent despite dropping settings that should make a difference. Foliage that plays really poorly with most of the anti-aliasing options, and even worse with 1080p. Some medium settings that look unacceptably bad for what's supposed to be the average choice. Shadows once again being the major culprit. I can get this game to mostly lock to 60 frames a second at 1440p, and a mix of high and ultra settings, but the drops were still annoying enough that I was constantly poking at settings throughout my capture, an extra tedious task considering the game crashes every time I change resolutions, and the Ubisoft launcher takes forever to load the game up. Also, if you see any footage from another channel, the flickering shadows would be why. Some of the footage I have simply seems too dangerous to use, so as I'm writing this, I'm not sure how much of it is viable. I'd replay missions again to grab new footage, but Ubisoft games of this era infamously only allow for one file and don't have mission selects. Still, I've been curious about the game as a whole for a long time, considering its controversy for being rushed and inaccurate to the pre-release showings. Well, I'm not curious anymore, and I realized I wasn't pretty quickly into playing. You want to review Watch Dogs 1 for me? Here it is. As a game, Watch Dogs 1 is mediocre in almost every way, with a few 7 or 8 out of 10 ideas and implementations of said ideas, and a few baffling choices that feel less mediocre and more just… bad. It's a shallow, often imbalanced, and bland realization of the interesting mechanical identity it wants to explore. Watch Dogs 1 is a weak driving game, and a bland but competent shooter, that mostly adds repetitive gimmick hacking options that are binary in design, and rarely makes the player feel powerful so much as it makes them feel lucky or exploitative of simple design. It's not a bad game, it's just by no means a good game, and sits at slightly below average for 2014. As a game, Watch Dogs 1 is an experience in crisis, because it refuses to commit to being more than a slightly remixed GTA clone. If you want this idea realized much more fully, I cannot recommend Watch Dogs 2 enough. More polished, more focused, more freeform, more of everything that Watch Dogs uniquely brings to the table. I'm getting that out of the way so that I can focus on something that I expected to be a small part of this video, which ended up being so shocking, baffling, and awful that I just had to make it the focus of this video. I could have enjoyed Watch Dogs 1 for very different reasons if this one aspect of it wasn't so ridiculously bad. Instead, I enjoyed playing Watch Dogs 1 as a slow motion train wreck that happened to have passable but bland gameplay. That issue I ran across, as is obvious by the title of this video, is that the main character, Aiden Pierce, is an awful human being. A narcissistic monster the likes of which you usually only see in villainous or anti-villain roles. And the game sees fit to reward him for it every step of the way. Aiden Pierce is the worst protagonist I've ever had the displeasure of playing as in a video game. Could there be worse protagonists? Yeah. Are there player characters like Trevor in GTA V that are more abhorrent as people? Of course. But I haven't played as one as bad as Aiden before that the accompanying game tries so hard to convince me becomes a better person and a legitimate hero we should respect and idolize. 
GTA 5 wants me to like Trevor as a murdering, dispassionate criminal who sees the world as his personal playground. Watch Dogs 1 wants me to like Aiden as the hacker vigilante version of Batman, who overcomes his baggage to become the voice of the victims and the downtrodden. So let me explain to you why I think this is ultimately the opposite of who Aiden is, and that this game completely fails to understand or respect its own themes, ideals, and basically every character except for Aiden. Really quickly, if you think this video sounds like one that's going to be interesting, maybe think about subscribing and leaving a like. Also, don't forget to comment if you have something to share by the end. Speaking of sharing, it's the best way to get your favorite creators to grow a healthy, sustainable channel. So if what you hear from me in this video is something you like enough, maybe think about sharing it in places where it could get more attention. See it, share it, repeat it. It's super duper appreciated. My first indication that there was something concerning about Aiden came almost immediately. While none of this is damning on its own, the first 30 minutes of Watch Dogs paints Aiden as a vindictive, cruel, selfish person who is convinced he's in complete control of the dire situations that surround him. As we'll see, the narrative's reverence for him, and softball at best critiques of his actions, retroactively destroy any weight the early game could have had. So what happens in those first 30 minutes? So, the game opens up on Aiden attempting to hack with a buddy of his, Damien. I don't think the game ever clearly outlines what their goals are, and I couldn't find anything online, but from the looks of it, they're attempting to steal hundreds of thousands of dollars from the building he's in and all the people inside. It seems like they're testing hacking into Chicago's new police state surveillance systems, known as CTOS, for the first time. However, someone is tracking their hack. Aiden tries to back out, but Damien is sure that they can lock the person out with just a few more seconds. So within the opening minute, we've established that Aiden is someone willing to steal from people that are deemed to have it coming because of their wealth. This is fine if we either establish the extent of wealth and a criticism of these people that's more legitimate than simply having an undefined amount of money, or if we establish that the conclusions Aiden is drawing are unjustified and he's just looking to shed guilt about stealing from innocent people. Regardless, he is supposed to be a pretty gray figure here ethically. As we play on, the narrative will very quickly establish that it's less gray though and instead posit that what Aiden is doing is wrong. The point is that he'll learn the difference between hacking selfishly and hacking for the benefit of others. Cut to a montage of someone ordering a hit on Aiden, and the hit going awry leading to the death of his niece, Lena, rather than Aiden. Eleven months later, we finally gain control of Aiden once he's found the man who was holding the gun in the hit, Maurice. Our first action is to dry fire a gun that Maurice thinks is loaded and about to end his life after watching Aiden brutalize him. While cruel, it's fair to ask us to empathize with his actions, considering he's trying to take revenge for the death of his niece. In a vacuum, that's fine, and again, it works if we're trying to establish that Aiden isn't a squeaky clean guy, if the narrative is willing to punish him for his excess cruelty and detachment, if it's willing to criticize his obsessiveness. Just outside, we find that Aiden's ally for this task is a man named Jordy. Jordy has elected to kill two gang members and is staging it as if it was gang violence. Not for any particular reason, but purely because he thinks it's delightful to sow such chaos. He tries to disguise this, and the fact that he called more gang members and the police, as a distraction so they can escape the baseball stadium unseen in all the chaos. Though realistically, this isn't necessary because we sneak through before any of the chaos happens, partially using a temporary blackout hack. So now we're aware of who Aiden surrounds himself with. Damien, whose greed festered alongside Aiden's and somehow led to the death of a six-year-old girl, and Jordy, a professional monster who thinks it's fun to start gang wars right outside of a massive sporting event that can get countless innocents caught in the crossfire. Aiden is annoyed at best when Jordy reveals his idea, but brushes it off. Pin that in your mind, by the way, for when we start talking about how Aiden reacts to murder, body counts, and specifically saving versus sacrificing innocent lives. So we escape quietly and make our way back to Aiden's humble apartment, where he's got your classic conspiracy board on the wall. 
Not the worst thing, but even by 2014, that trope was already most commonly being used to indicate that someone is unhinged, rather than doing any form of stable or thoughtful sleuthing. Immediately, though, things go from a 3 out of 10 to an 11, because Aiden casually pulls up a camera feed, get this, a camera feed in his sister Nikki's house so that he can secretly spy on her and her son Jackson. For me, we already have an act that I personally don't think is redeemable. The whole premise of someone exploiting a police state anti-privacy network for his own personal gain and at the expense of innocent people is bad enough, but using it to obsessively watch over a woman and her child without her knowledge or consent is extremely disturbing to me. Even nine years ago, I remember seeing this and being made really uncomfortable by it, so I don't think it's really something that was just a sign of the times the game was made in. To be clear, while we'll get to the game's amazing hypocrisy, Watch Dogs does want us to think this is not okay, but it also expects that we won't feel like it's crossing a line from which Aiden can't return, and I just can't get on board with that. Still, it's just one thing, and it's a pretty quick moment. I can still get behind the intent of the storytelling even if I don't completely align with the moral stance it's taking. It can be a moment of bad writing in a good story. Unfortunately, as soon as we wake up for the next day, the game doubles down on this type of writing, and from here on, it never slows down for very long in this regard. The first thing we're tasked with doing when we leave Aiden's apartment is finding a potential crime that's about to go down and stopping it before it happens. Yes. No exaggeration, we're supposed to be using the CTOS surveillance system in order to find someone that a corporate program decides is a potential criminal, and we're supposed to quote-unquote heroically stop that crime right before it happens. To be fair to Ubisoft, it's clear that they recognize the suspect nature of this idea as a whole. So they do as much as they can to try and justify it. You basically always see texts beforehand that strongly suggest the potential criminal is devoted to actually committing the crime. It also seems to always be between parties that already know each other rather than just someone waiting in an alley to mug whoever happens to come by that looks like they have a fat wallet. And the system makes you wait until basically the last second before intervention is allowed, but even this makes no sense. And in a classic Ubisoft political softball, they make it easy to rationalize mechanically as well. These people will always commit the crime as far as I know, so as the player, there is no ethical question in relation to gameplay. Aiden will never end up in a situation where he actually stalks and tries to punish, or even kill, someone for a thought crime because the omniscience afforded to us by the mechanic itself says there will always be a real crime. But thematically, the intent here is to display this act as a heroic, just use of the system. Keep in mind, we're talking about a system where a program developed by a company will learn is extremely evil and unconcerned with the ethical treatment of people they exploit, is used by a police state to try and predict how likely someone is to be a criminal. Historically, systems like this, including modern ones, are frighteningly biased. Sometimes it's because the creators of the systems themselves were biased, or missed something important. Other times it's because the means by which the systems obtain information doesn't give the same results for people who look different from whatever samples they train the system on. Regardless, the way CTOS predicts crime is completely opaque to us as the player, and to Aiden as the protagonist as far as we know. This means thematically these crime-stopping minigames fail to bolster him as a just vigilante whenever he uses this system. When the people are always going to perform the crime, it doesn't say anything about CTOS, nor any potential real-life equivalent's ability to be used to stop crime effectively. And when Aiden uses the system with no knowledge of its biases, and without the fourth wall understanding that everyone he comes across will commit the crime, that choice reads like the game's writers approving of the idea that this knowledge is unnecessary, that a crime-predicting form of state-sponsored surveillance can be used justly, without any assurance that the system is accurate and unbiased. That intent of the person using the system is more important than the intent of the supposed criminal to Ubisoft. 
While it wouldn't necessarily stop the crime permanently, a more ethical option would be one of the minigame's fail states, stopping the potential crime by spooking the person away earlier. Yes, waiting until the last second proves, in huge air quotes, that they were going to commit the crime. But like, if the point is to de-escalate the situation and prevent someone from being the victim of a crime, then it really shouldn't matter if the potential criminal is put in prison or not. And that doesn't even get into the implications of filling already bloated prison systems with more people instead of focusing on actual crime prevention, or limiting recidivism rates if any of these people are repeat offenders, or the fact that you can kill the these people, and the game still quantifies this is a success, no matter how far the potential crime in question would have gone. When you put all of this together, you start to recognize that this minigame is horrifying as a concept, and yet it's the first open world thing the game is eager to tutorialize to you. This is what it leads with. The worst part is that this isn't even all that's wrong with this design choice. The minigame is bad enough. Making it the first thing you tutorialize for the open world is worse. But beyond that, Aiden is basically doing this to blow off steam. He is misusing the police state infrastructure for his own amusement and to bolster his personal sense of justice, rather than to stop the actual crime itself. It doesn't happen upon him, he seeks it out. But it gets even worse, because the game establishes that he's doing this in spite of already being late for his nephew's birthday party. We'll learn in a bit that Aiden is flaky as heck and Jackson really looks up to him and needs his uncle in his life since we see no signs of his father. But what's more, Jackson has serious trauma related to the death of his younger sister and struggles to emotionally connect with anyone other than Aiden and his mother. He has shut down to the point that he doesn't even really talk, which is his defining characteristic in the narrative, other than also having the need to escape at points. Jackson also doesn't know that Aiden is responsible for the death of his sister, Lena, and I'm still not even sure that Nikki does either. I can't recall a time where any specifics are brought up, probably because, once again, the writers knew that was a line nobody would be okay with someone in their life crossing. If you knew someone got your daughter killed and is responsible for your son's trauma because he wanted to be a leet hacker that steals a couple hundred thousand dollars from random people, yeah, you're not going to want to continue to ask him to be a part of your and your son's life. Aiden never tells them, by the way. So, Aiden has woken up this morning and decided to use Big Brother surveillance systems to stop thought crimes for personal gratification, knowing that it means he's going to miss the birthday party of a nephew that Aiden's actions traumatized into silence, despite Aiden being one of two people this young boy desperately needs present in his life. And while the game does criticize this once we get to what's left of the birthday party, it rewards Aiden in the meantime. When we finally get to Jackson's party, Aiden spends like five minutes there. During this time, he lies to his sister about how he's a changed man and doesn't do the hacker thing anymore. She gets a disturbing prank call that he intercepts and listens to without her knowledge or consent, and then he leaves, abandoning Jackson before they've spent any time together to track down and punish the caller. He didn't even get Jackson a birthday present. He just shows up, lies, invades privacy, and then ducks out to chase down and potentially kill someone. The video feed from the night before when Aiden was spying, by the way, yeah, that was a conversation between Nikki and Jackson where Nikki tried to assure her son that Aiden would make it to the party because he genuinely cared. And this is all just the first 30 minutes of the game. This is the introduction to our character, and he has already chosen to be so vile that I can't imagine anyone rooting for him and supporting him while playing, if they're actively engaging with the narrative here at all. And just 30 minutes and a couple of missions after that, we get a flashback to Aiden visiting Lena's grave with Nikki that's supposed to be touching. But given what we already know, it's only more disgusting when he once again says that he won't put Nikki and Jackson in harm's way, despite obsessing with the idea that he's their protector, while kneeling over his niece's grave. We don't need to see him lying to Nikki here when we already know that he's lying to her in the present, meaning that the purpose of the scene can't be related to revealing that fact. 
sure, it is pretty awful that he outright promises to stop his attempts at revenge here, but the promise doesn't make the difference if he's lying to her in the present still. So the safest assumption is that the game's narrative thinks we need to know that he has a good heart inside. It suggests that what they're trying to say here is that wanting to protect Nikki and Jax against their will by invading their privacy and hunting down and hurting or killing people isn't disempowering or frightening, but is instead noble. Personally, I'm also kind of disgusted by the fact that Nikki says things like, we've all suffered a horrible nightmare, as an attempt to console a stone-cold Aiden when she lost her daughter and it's Aiden's fault. He is of course allowed to be just as sad as her, but it comes off as absolutely dismissive of her struggles that so much of her time in this game is dedicated to consoling Aiden. This is the closest we see to understanding how much Nikki knows about Aiden's part in Lena's death, by the way. He outright says that he killed her, though he doesn't say how, and Nikki vehemently disagrees with him, suggesting she doesn't know how. She says she doesn't blame him, which is technically within her rights, even if she knew everything. But it makes very little sense in the context of the narrative. We're eventually told that she looked up to Aiden all of her life, but he didn't want her hanging around his friends as he got older. But we're given very little reason to believe the two of them have been close this whole time. She spends a fair few of her lines criticizing the fact that he's fallen so deeply into criminal behavior, as if that has put real distance in between them. In which case, why wouldn't she blame him so hard that she never wants to speak to him again? It's his fault. And then to know that she now recognizes he lied to her on that day? She should be done with him several times over, at very least for the sake of Jackson's safety and future. Directly after this scene, Aiden suggests that maybe Nikki was right. He can't change Lena's death, but then he completely ignores that bit of introspection to go back to hacking and killing. Like literally, right after those lines, Jordy calls about someone surviving the stadium mission at the start, who could ID Aiden? And Aiden is all aboard helping Jordy find him so they can stop him from talking by any means necessary. Jordy, by the way, is still holding Maurice hostage for Aiden, and Jordy makes it clear he's torturing Maurice regularly. After meeting up with Jordy, we sneak through a train yard full of enemies, and once we get the information we need, more enemies ambush Aiden, forcing us to go loud. While this time and many other times the game allows us to simply escape instead, it doesn't always do so. And in this case, Jordy will occasionally snipe enemies no matter what, which Aiden is ultimately complicit in. In doing this, we find out that the guy who could ID Aiden is in prison. He's likely to talk, so Aiden decides to enter the prison and scare him so completely that he'll keep quiet. This mission is another one that is pretty horrific when you really think about it. We sneak through most of the prison until we get to the room where a few crooked officers are beating up the guy we need to get to. Yes, this is undeniably wrong. It's a genuine problem for the incarcerated in real life and it needs to stop. Aiden decides to stop it by stealing a semi-auto shotgun and gunning down everyone in the room. He then is forced to gun down several other officers who heard the gunfire, but are, as far as we know, innocent. The game doesn't question this. We scare the witness by threatening to change his 60-day sentence into a 60-year sentence, and then we have to escape the police in the open world. We don't have to gun down anyone else here, but even if we don't, many of the hacking options Aiden has could still very easily lead to the deaths of several of them, and innocent civilians. It would be easy to just assume Aiden's hacks always narrowly avoid killing people if he wasn't so ready to gun down people outright. Isn't it a bit hypocritical to not want to kill this one witness, by the way, while murdering at least a dozen other people to get to him. It makes his faux concern with avoiding bloodshed if he can ring yet more hollow. It wouldn't be as big of a deal, and could just be seen as your standard issue with ludonarrative dissonance, except that this precarious balance of morality is what Aiden's entire character arc is built around, and the game ultimately wants us to feel like he's made progress and is a good 
good person who did some bad things for good reasons. If we're narratively going to suggest these cops are corrupt for bullying and beating up this prisoner, we can't act like Aiden is cool for murdering them, empathetic for coercive behavior toward the witness of his previous crimes, and a hero for choosing not to kill him. All well protecting his sister and her son from everyone but himself. Hopefully at this point you're seeing the problem with Watch Dogs 1 come into view. The issue is that I simply don't believe Watch Dogs when it tries to tell me it also thinks Aiden is a bad guy. Because they don't paint him as sympathetically broken and shaped by violence. They paint him as a stubborn vigilante asshole who likes to feign empathy. Someone who actively chooses to cause violence, which then ricochets back at him and those around him. But then he's only rewarded for his violence by the narrative. Once again, this is not GTA 5, where, while we may sympathize with the characters on some level, we still very clearly understand these are awful people, and so does the narrative. This game wants us to see Aiden as an everyman who is subverting the use of a corporate police state to do good. And while Watch Dogs 2 has an issue with letting us gun down dozens of people despite painting our characters as youthful, bright-eyed rebels who want freedom to enjoy life in their privacy, it doesn't force us into situations where we have to do something horrendous while reassuring us that we're the good guy. Every step of the way, Aiden puts those he cares for in harm's way, and then the game praises him and treats him like a good guy for getting them back out. There's even a radio news broadcast that says people are rallying behind Aiden Pierce, which comes in a couple of different flavors, and I personally had it show up at least six or seven times while playing through the game. The game even has a karma system, which I'm sure most people don't remember because it has almost no effect on the game. It's extremely easy to keep it positive, seems to go way up whenever you stop the aforementioned thought crimes, and also makes it very clear what it considers an innocent person versus someone who isn't, with a big red CIVILIAN KILLED message. You basically have to play this game like your GTA 5's Trevor if he decided to join a human extinction cult if you want to bring the meter down into the negative. The messaging here is clear. Aiden is appalled by the idea that Bloom uses CTOS to spy on private homes while he literally can do exactly that whenever he hacks into their major servers. There's no comment from him or the game about how gross or hypocritical that is, nor about the fact that he was doing it to Nikki. The only comment is Aiden being appalled by Bloom logging these feeds before giving him free reign to watch them himself. And you see people in many very vulnerable positions if you watch through these feeds, I can say that much. I think it's interesting that Watch Dogs gives everyone you hurt, kill, steal from, or pass by a name, occupation, age, income, and trait, as if to criticize how you treat people if you're a bad Aiden. But this still applies to all the people the game forces you to kill, or encourages you to. There's never a meaningful mechanic or narrative criticism for just being bad, doubly so when the karma system doesn't react. You can blow away a security guy for Bloom who's just trying to make a living guarding a random building he probably knows nothing about, or steal from a young woman in her early 20s who makes $22,000 a year and has to pay for pancreatic cancer bills, and neither Aiden, the narrative, nor the karma system bats an eye. Again, this isn't normal ludonarrative dissonance. This isn't a case where cutscene Aiden and gameplay Aiden basically exist in separate realms. They're both equally horrible. This is a character that's surrounded by a godlike being in the form of the narrative text, which treats him like he's a hero and a martyr. One with problems, but with good intentions, a good heart, and who does good in the end. It's enough to make you feel sick. While it may be up to the player in some situations if they massacre people or how awful they choose to be, it's not in many cases. And it's also not in the main story beats. I can't make Aiden leave his family out of it, or make him drop Jordy, or make him not kill all those cops in the jail. In most regards, Aiden is not my character to shape, and his is not my story to tell. I think it's telling that Aiden narrates so much when he's alone, and I honestly wonder if it's because they knew. I wonder if it's because they were aware that a player who's thinking about this at all can't possibly be expected to align with him. Normally, we'd be the ones thinking, 
I guess I have to do what Damien says for now so Nikki is safe. When Damien shows back and tells us he kidnapped Nikki and that we have to do what he asks if we want her back. We wouldn't need Aiden to spell it out. The player doesn't have to be in tune with the protagonist, but we should at least be able to understand their mindset, and it should feel consistent with the role that the narrative sets them in. Though, part of the problem is that the narrative is also kind of poorly constructed in a few other ways. There are several times where the game just gives us a mission marker with no indication of what we're doing, because Aiden has a plan, but the narrative clues us in on absolutely nothing until we get there. Like this bit where, after the previous mission, we're simply given a marker. We make our way there, and when we arrive, Aiden will finally illustrate why we've driven to the pawn shop. Yes, it's a tutorial for part of the crafting system, but tutorial or not, it's weak mission design and writing. You know how GTA San Andreas did that nearly 20 years ago? They had Sweet tell us at the end of a mission that if we're gonna start representing the Grove again, we need to rep the colors and should go buy clothes. It's narratively driven and organic as a way to tutorialize that aspect of the game's mechanic. The narrative here and the mission design would largely be uninspired and weak either way, in spite of a premise dripping with the ability to tell gripping, emotionally complex stories with sharp commentary. But Aiden is what brings it from mediocre and lifeless to outright bad at times. From here, it's not necessary to detail the majority of the missions and events. Many of them have little to do with anything and are instead set up or busy work for characters or later missions. The basic premise from here forward is that Damien reiterates that there was a third person hacking that day when it all went wrong. There are some files that should reveal what that person was doing and he is keeping Nikki hostage until Aiden retrieves them. What Aiden doesn't know is that Damien has sold out to Bloom. They're the ones who actually want the files because there's a specific one that shows that Bloom and a big time mobster in the city Lucky Quinn were conspiring to hide video CTOS captured of the mayor killing a woman. That's important to them because Bloom doesn't want that kind of blemish on CTOS's record and Lucky Quinn used his power to rig the election and ensure the mayor won. Twice in the narrative, people related to Damien attempt to kidnap Jackson as well, when Jackson runs away. We'll talk about one of these moments in a bit. Other than that, Aiden gains a couple of other allies, a woman named Clara, who's part of a hacker group, DeadSec, and it's eventually revealed feels immense guilt for taking part in the events that led to Lena's death, and another hacker who lives off the grid but was part of Bloom and the construction of CTOS, T-Bone. T-Bone is also responsible for a major blackout in New York City a decade prior to the events of the game, which ended in the deaths of a few innocent people. Meanwhile, the main villains end up being Damien, Jordy, who turns on us near the end for some reason, a man named Iraq, who is a gang leader that seems to have the files we need for Damien, and Lucky Quinn. Aiden's goals are primarily still to get revenge on everyone involved in Lena's death, and to save Nikki while keeping Jackson safe. This conspiracy stuff really is a backseat type of thing for him. It's convenient for him to take care of it because it ultimately leads him to his revenge. And while the narrative suggests that he cares, all of his major choices and actions are related to Nikki and his revenge. We never go that far out of his way to do anything else for the good of the city and its people, but rest assured that Aiden still terrorizes, hurts, or kills many people along the way, many of whom might deserve it, and quite a few who probably don't. And each time, the narrative at most suggests that maybe it was just a bit cruel, but still justified. One minor thing I want to mention, by the way, is that I think it's hilarious that Aiden is supposed to be this expert hacker, but he doesn't even keep off-site backups of his hard drives and such, hence why he's pretty frustrated when he loses his computer and his drives when his apartment is destroyed. There's a point about halfway through that I can't really show for obvious reasons where Aiden heads into an underground club pretending to be someone else so that he can receive an invite to an auction. In the club you find a woman who is supposed to be a special gift for the person Aiden is pretending to be. Given the context, it's obvious that she didn't exactly choose this line of work for herself. As you would expect from Aiden, he chooses to use his magic hacker phone and big guns to do absolutely nothing. Instead, he gets an ally to make a special request for her to be at the auction so he can get her out, ignoring every other woman stuck in the club. 
If you watched my video on Two Worlds, you might remember a quest I talked about where you could take down the better rebellion faction, violently take down the corrupt faction with more power, or take down the corrupt faction by exposing their corruption without violence. But if you do it the latter way, the corrupt faction runs off with a tortured woman they had imprisoned. It's a difficult decision narratively, because you don't want to have to wipe out everyone within the corrupt faction because not all of them know about the corruption. But you also don't want to sacrifice the freedom, safety, and maybe even the life of this one woman to avoid violence either. It's the trolley problem, basically. But here, there's nothing. Aiden has taken down dozens and dozens of people with bigger guns than him. He has hacker superpowers and a backdoor connection into the fascist police state surveillance system, and he literally plans to use it to save just one woman from the horrors going on, purely because he talked to her briefly. It's not until this woman refuses to leave the auction if he doesn't help her get the other women out that he's convinced to help. But not in a scene that's a clash of wills or one that shows why Aiden is wrong for his shallow attempts to help. She just bravely says she's not leaving without her friends and he says, Okay, he'll figure it out as if he's figuring out nearby locations where they can eat lunch. It's apparently that easy for him and yet he wasn't going to help. I'm gonna try and work around YouTube suppression here with choice language. But this makes the auction bit with tons of exposed prizes being auctioned off feel gratuitous. It makes it feel like it's for the player's benefit rather than as a showcase of how disturbing the whole thing is. Because don't be mistaken, this is horrifying, but the game up to this point hasn't earned such a shocking display. It feels cheap. And how does Aiden deal with the conundrum he's faced with? Oh, he just guns down all the people outside and then calls the police. The funny thing is that there's reason to believe that some of the police are in Lucky Quinn's pocket and are likely to look the other way. So this feels like such a lame, dispassionate, and distant way to help these women. Bottom of the barrel and less than the bare minimum. We don't even know if any of the women, including the one he personally talked to, were saved, outside of it maybe being mentioned on an optional radio spot. So we just have to assume that killing a bunch of people and then calling the police was enough. And none of this really even gets into the male protector, female, sexually exploited damsel shtick going on here. The game then forces you to gun down a large number of guys to save Jackson for the second time. Jackson happens to see the bloodbath through security camera footage while he's hiding in the building the kidnappers are surrounding. Jackson is understandably scared and seemingly traumatized afterwards. Aiden asks himself if he's the bad guy, and then the game proceeds to reward him by having Jackson finally speak to him for what I believe is the first time since he was burdened with the trauma of losing his sister. What does the kid say? Well. Aiden asks Jackson not to run away again, because knowing he's safe is what keeps Aiden strong. And that leads Jackson to comparing himself to a healer in a video game. Obviously, there are undertones suggesting he knows what Aiden did was still gruesome and awful, and it could have a huge impact, when Jackson then contrasts that statement by pointing out that this isn't a game, it's real life. But given Aiden seems to see that as a success regardless, and the fact that the narrative never makes him pay for further traumatizing his nephew completely, that potential bit of narrative reflection is completely undermined. Also, Aiden never tells his sister about Jackson being hunted down twice, nor witnessing his uncle massacre a dozen people. It's never brought up again. Sometime before this, in some of the most painful and long-winded tailing sections I've ever done in a game, we're tasked with spying on a younger cousin of the gang leader Iraq, who goes by Bedbug. This is very much a kid who seems to just be in over his head. He wants to appear like a tough gangster type, but he really isn't suited for that life, especially when Iraq treats him and everyone else so poorly. Aiden terrorizes him in an attempt to coerce Bedbug into getting into Iraq's server room and downloading the files Damien needs. Once the plan is ready, Aiden remarks that he hope he doesn't get Bedbug killed because he's only 19 and he's so green. Ten minutes later, Bedbug is seemingly killed by Iraq and we are more concerned with escaping the area. Great. 
Once we do escape, Aiden focuses almost entirely on whether he got the necessary files or not. Thankfully, Bedbug survived, but Aiden isn't at all bothered by or critiqued for what he'd just done. One has to ask why superhero hacker Aiden couldn't have just sneaked through Iraq's compound himself instead of guiding Bedbug through. Bedbug dies if Aiden gets him caught. It's not like he can just walk through the building. He doesn't have any greater access to the server room than Aiden does. He can't be seen and Aiden has to solve how to get into the room when Bedbug arrives, giving the impression that Bedbug's involvement here is arbitrary, simply as a way to keep Aiden out of harm's way and use someone else as the meat shield. A 19 year old kid who's in way over his head, and Aiden isn't sure if the kid deserves to be put in this situation that he's putting him in. I find it rather rich that the narrative gives Aiden the nickname Vigilante. It's something a few people and the citizens of Chicago have started calling him. It's supposed to come with anti-hero connotations obviously, but it's also obviously supposed to be endearing, with it being used positively by those that support him and with contempt by those that don't. It's the equivalent of calling Batman the Dark Knight. Aiden is arguably closer to an emotionless psychopath, or at least an empathyless sociopath, who agrees with people who point out what he's doing wrong, purely so that he can continue unobstructed by them on his destructive path, manipulating and using others as pawns. Even three quarters the way through the game, Aiden gets a call from Jordy and talks to Maurice. The guy still seems like he's just a pawn, a hired gun with no new information to share, and as such, no narrative justification for his continued imprisonment. During this call, Maurice is clearly devastated and traumatized that he killed a little girl in his attempt to get to Aiden. He was still a hired hitman, of course, but he feels extreme remorse and continues to do so for the rest of the storyline. But Aiden feels nothing at this revelation, refusing to face the reality that he's the cause of his niece's death. And again, there's never a punishment for doing this to Maurice. We even have control over whether he lives or dies in the end, which is something we'll touch on when we get there. But the story never really questions what Aiden is paying Jordy to do to Maurice, and never makes him face any consequences. Future me jumping in really quickly to talk for a brief moment about some of the side content. Originally, I had no plans to touch on any of it other than the crime stopping minigame since it's forced upon you, but I decided I should at least mess with a bit of all of it and see if it affects my conclusions here. In short, it does, but only because it all continues to add on to my frustrations with the narrative's treatment of Aiden. A fair amount of it doesn't have much or anything that meaningful to do with his characterization, but then some does. Criminal convoys and fixer contracts basically force you to put more people in harm's way and force you to kill people respectively. Criminal convoys are similar to a story mission where you intercept a convoy of cars and stop them from reaching their destination using force. I don't really see how you can do these without killing everyone other than the target, out in the open roads and such. And fixer contracts ask you to use vehicles to run from the police as a distraction or steal a vehicle from people willing to open fire in the middle of the road. They aren't exactly what I'd call helping the city of Chicago. Gang hideouts are also basically about killing people to get to a hideout leader and knock them out. There are audio logs you can find from Maurice that seem to further and further humanize him, which makes Aiden's heartlessness throughout the story in relation to Maurice less and less congruent with his eventual identity as a hero. Privacy invasion collectibles have Aiden hack someone's house surveillance system by choice. It's basically one step further than watching the wireframe CTOS logs. Aiden will sit there and watch people's most vulnerable moments with no reaction. He won't call the police when he finds an old man unconscious or potentially dead on the floor, along with a message from his son hoping to see him soon. He'll stay silent when a woman is verbally abusing her children and refusing to feed them. And this is beyond the fact that he's spying like a creeper in the first place. Which is interesting because he does get vocal when he finds the chance to maybe shoot a random mugger in a crime stopping minigame, or when he gets closer to finding a human trafficker he can hurt in the human trafficker briefcase hunt. The thing is, all of these are things Aiden can do, 
so we have to assume narratively that these are all things Aiden is willing to do, or does do. Given the game ultimately wants him to be a hero, we can't just pretend it doesn't say anything when we get good reputation for the violent or dangerous stuff, and don't get negative reputation for things like privacy invasions. We all know what this suggests. If we assume the human trafficking side missions are related to the actual auction story missions on that subject, as it seems like it is, then it's yet another mark against Aiden. He isn't that concerned with helping the women escape, but he sure will track every bidder and everyone else involved down in order to hurt some of them. You can't even kill the bidders, by the way, because they're considered civilians, and you're punished for it. You're punished for exacting justice on people who bid on owning a other people. Oh, but you sure can kill someone for maybe potentially planning to possibly mug someone else, and you'll get good reputation for that. If this was a commentary on how our society tends to let people that have huge social favor get away with monstrous things, while well, some people in this country seem to think death is a worthy punishment for stealing a wallet to feed your starving kids, then that would be fair. But the game never touches on this. It never critiques it. Aiden treats any level of criminality, or even thought of criminality, more or less the same. Except for human trafficking bidders. I'll admit, I wasn't chomping at the bit to 100% the game, so I didn't finish any of the side mission strands completely, so I can't say for sure what their ultimate points might be. But either way, the ethical imbalance is there. I did a bit of everything, but ultimately nothing was changing my mind. It just added fuel to the fire, so I decided there's no point. It's unnecessary to point out every single example of Aiden being terrible. Genuinely, the harshest punishment that Aiden directly faces is the death of Lena, but that's more of a punishment for his nephew and sister, and Nikki being taken by Damien isn't a punishment because he gets her back and she appreciates it with minimal criticism of the fact that he got her kidnapped in the first place. When he finally finds her and helps her escape, the both of them deciding that she and Jackson should leave and never look back, she tells him that they're still on good terms. She talks about how she's always idolized him, the implication being that she still does, and yet right before this scene, she was horrified to learn that Aiden is being hunted down by the police for multiple instances of mass murder. Immediately after this, after he sees her off, Aiden says that Lucky Quinn brought all of this on Aiden and his family. Again, Lucky Quinn is an awful person, but Aiden did the hacking. He crossed the wrong people, he got his niece murdered, and then he has since killed at least dozens, if not hundreds depending on how you play, all to get revenge. That is his primary motivator from second one to now. Lucky Quinn barely has a presence, by the way, and is a generic, pure evil old fart, which is why the twist that Lena's death in the attempt on Aiden's life was based on a misunderstanding doesn't work. So basically, Quinn thought Aiden and Damien were trying to obtain the video of the mayor murdering someone, so they hired someone to paint Aiden out of the picture with a few bullets. And while that revelation could say something about the ultra-powerful and wealthy, seeing everyone else as dehumanized pawns in the game they play, and to be clear, this was the intent, it ultimately doesn't work because Aiden blames Lucky for it all despite Aiden's actions. In essence, because the story doesn't want us to blame Aiden for this, it has to set Lucky up as so inhumanly and comically despicable that it obfuscates Aiden's chunk of the blame. But Aiden was still hacking with Damien and still tried to get revenge which led to this story's events. He did it. He kicked the beehive in the middle of an event in the park and then blamed the bees when they stung all of the partygoers. It doesn't matter if Lucky Quinn is the one that transplanted the beehive there the night before. They're both to blame. I'm not saying Aiden shouldn't have messed with Quinn, but he wasn't interested in Quinn until he figured out Quinn was behind Lena's death. He takes down Quinn for revenge, not because he's an awful chewed up piece of leather with a dorky sweater on. Damien is just a bitter asshole as well. No depth, just villain. None of it works to reflect on Aiden because again, Aiden doesn't get punished. 
After Quinn dies, Aiden remarks that he did feel satisfaction through achieving his revenge, cementing his psychotic, awful persona as a permanent fixture of his characterization, which the story simply isn't interested in actually critiquing. It's only interested in pretending to critique it. We're then supposed to feel angry because Clara dies shortly after this. She and T-Bone were basically the only decent people who are helping Aiden by choice. But get this, she dies because she was going to offer herself up as a replacement for Nikki, so Damien sent a hit squad after her. Once again, this is Aiden's fault. People decided to put themselves at risk for him, and they pay the price for his callous indifference. And of course, because the game doesn't have a spine, Clara does what everyone else does. After her death, we get a final message from her where she says she feels bad about having anything to do with Lena's death, and knew Aiden really loves Jackson. And she was shot, leaving flowers at Lena's grave, revealing that she was the mystery person doing so the whole time. Just like everyone else, she pushes Aiden's blame onto others, suggesting that he's clearly a force for good. It's insufferable. And it's amazing that after all this, Aiden himself thinks he's the hero, and that Nikki and Jackson will be safe just because they left and he doesn't know where to. It's doubly rich by the time the second game comes around and CTOS has spread, meaning she can't hide from the system, which is apparently hilariously easy to hack. For me, it's pretty damned gross that the women in Aiden's life are all the ones that suffer the harshest consequences. Lena dies, Clara dies, Nikki is kidnapped, threatened with the death of her son, and then is forced to leave her life entirely to start over from scratch. Heck, even Nikki's therapist is lightly criticized by the narrative for being suspicious of Aiden, purely because the narrative can't shit-talk its golden boy. The game is clearly trying to suggest that she has a point, but you can't just point that out and call it good. You have to punish Aiden in ways that align with her argument, or at least have him recognize that she's right. Otherwise, he's just getting away with murder while she's contextually painted as the unfair one. Think it doesn't get worse from here now that the big bad is dealt with? Think again. So all that's left from here is dealing with Damien, Jordy, and Maurice. Damien ends up with control of CTOS, and T-Bone and Aiden need to create a blackout across the city in order to temporarily stop Damien from trying to take Aiden down with the city's infrastructure, and to pinpoint where he's doing it from. There's a strong suggestion that this blackout could lead to many deaths, considering T-Bone's blackout in 2003 that was designed to highlight the power a hack of CTOS could have ended in the deaths of 11 people. This is actually funny because this blackout actually happened for unrelated reasons in real life. In the real blackout, though, roughly a hundred people are reported to have died, suggesting that the writers here maybe thought a hundred deaths was crossing the line with T-Bone, and would leave him irredeemable. Or that it would make the idea of causing another one at the end of the game irredeemably awful. Regardless, they end up going for it, which requires driving to three different points on the map and uploading a virus. All while Damien blows up underground pipes, raises blockers, messes with traffic lights, and calls the police on Aiden's location. I did end up getting through this mission without shooting any officers, but it's shockingly difficult considering how many bullets they put into your car every time you get in a new one, and how willing they are to smash you off the road. I'd reckon that most players would kill dozens and dozens, not to mention that Aiden choosing to cross so much of the city back and forth probably leads to Damien's antics killing tons more people. Every traffic light manipulation is a multi-car crash. Many pipes exploding will hit civilian vehicles, and how many times does a civilian car, an officer's vehicle, or Aiden swerve into the people on the sidewalk? How many officers push Aiden's car into people on the sidewalk? As a mission, it's actually pretty engaging outside of the largest and most obnoxious flashing glitch effects on the screen, but we're being told to compare this to an event where T-Bone was responsible for the deaths of just 11 people, and we're told to believe that this is a better option than thinking it through a bit more. Damien doesn't seem to mess with anything that isn't around Aiden, because Aiden is his goal. Like. I don't know. This is a case where I can't think of a better option, but the writers and developers are also free to do a lot of different things here. And what I do know is that the option to set up a mission where at least 11 people are likely to die, and set it up in direct opposition to an instance with just 11 casualties, 
feels silly. It's also a bit strange considering we are free to use blackouts across the entire game without being criticized for it, and there's even a blackout craftable in the entrance of the building where we decide that's our solution. We have to use a blackout in the first mission of the game. I just don't think that you can have Aiden remark that more lives might be lost if they don't do it and treat that as an adequate justification for what happens afterwards, especially because this mission is before the blackout we cause. How much more deaths does the actual blackout incur? Right after this, we succeed at creating the blackout. Aiden claims that he understands that working with Damien and doing the original job was a mistake. But he also says that he doesn't make mistakes like that anymore. Instead, he sees problems and fixes them. It literally feels like parody at this point. Like someone who literally cannot escape their own head. Because he gets betrayed by quite a few people during this game, while making really foolish decisions that get people around him killed, or encourage him to kill others. Nothing that he has done during this game is even slightly different from the job he now feels like he's above. He's no less prone to mistakes, or horrifying actions. And I cannot believe for a second that Endgame Aiden wouldn't still do stuff like spy on his sister's house every evening, or intercept her calls and then kill people on her behalf without her knowledge. The only thing that's stopping him from finding her and doing it again is that until CTOS spreads, he'd have to find her the old-fashioned way in order to do so. But he can still do the exact same thing to anyone else in his life, or just anyone in general. This is just Aiden Pierce. Aiden's speech at the end seals his fate as a trash human being that makes me angry just thinking about it. Aiden thinks he's a hero, but he isn't. He hasn't changed, he isn't a hero, he's a villain. He happens to luck into finding the necessary hacker help during this game's narrative so that he could murder dozens of people to get to a few other villains for personal reasons unrelated to most of their villainy. When he mentions that he'd naively tried to fix a little girl's death, I had the tiniest hope as he said those actions, quote, led to all this. I'd hoped he was at least acknowledging for once that it led to needless death, destruction, and abuses that were unacceptable. That wouldn't fix all the issues, but at least it would contradict how obsessed with and proud he's been of his revenge scheme. But nope, it's at that point when he pats himself on the back for taking down Quinn and everything. He legit thinks he's Batman. No, really, hold that thought in your mind for one last scene for me. So after the credits, we get a brief monologue from Aiden about Maurice's actions, as compared to his own. He starts talking philosophical bullshit about who chooses which people deserve to die. And we come in on a scene where we as the player get to choose. Does Maurice die, or do we walk away and let him live? This game actually has the balls, after everything that has led up to this point, to act like it has earned the opportunity to end on a complex moral choice. To defy Aiden and let Maurice live, or to kill Maurice like we have countless others. But that doesn't work when the narrative just got done telling us through Aiden himself that he's a changed man, that killing Maurice would be unlike the new Aiden, and that letting him leave would be the right answer. But no, no, he wouldn't let Maurice walk away. No version of Aiden in this entire game would do that. Get real. When you do walk away, Aiden remarks that Maurice is living his personal hell and deserves a second chance which completely contradicts him asking who decides who lives and dies just a minute ago. Aiden just decided that. When you instead shoot Maurice, the game doesn't comment. It just ends with the gunshot, because it doesn't have the spine to admit that it told a story about a stalker and a killer it paints as a hero. All of this is messy enough because Aiden's actions contradict his words, but some of his words also contradict his other words, and how the narrative treats Aiden contradicts how it wants to paint him as an anti-hero. And then to be handed a choice like this, when Aiden just got done saying he feels he's finally above killing people in cold blood, maybe, just maybe, he probably should have just showed us that by not letting the player kill Maurice. But if you wait and let Maurice and Aiden talk a bit, it gets worse, because it always gets worse. You know what Aiden says at one point? He justifies all of his previous actions because now the villains have something to fear. 
He's a delusional monster who thinks he's fucking Batman, who tells himself that he's a hero while destroying the lives of everyone around him. Come on. I don't know if I'll ever hate a game protagonist more than Aiden Pierce. And it's all because the story he's in adores him, no matter what fake bullshit it might show us about questioning his ethics. I have never experienced a game narrative with a character who conflicts so hard with the text of the narrative itself, in a way that's so politically and ethically charged. I feel like part of the issue here is that the game was clearly rushed and unfinished at launch, but I also don't think that's an excuse. Despite writing all this out, I still cannot distill my frustrations with Aiden Pierce down enough to feel satisfied. You cannot simply point to criticisms of Aiden in the narrative and then wash your hands of everything. Narrative writing doesn't work like that. The worst part is that all the game had to do was not treat him like a hero. If Aiden wants to self-congratulate his violent psychopathy, then fine. Criticize it. Don't throw him a party where everyone around him who is trying to do good dies. Make it a dark story where we feel gross for having acted out Aiden's choices by the end, let alone for having enjoyed it along the way. Or make it a story where Aiden gets buried in the consequences of his reckless actions and is reborn out the other side ready to make a change. And please, for the love of quality games writing, don't exclusively try to punish him by hurting, traumatizing, or killing all of the women and children around him, before then having THEM simp for the stupid shit as well? Watch Dogs 1 is a perfect example of how you can't have it both ways in narrative design. There's no focus here, and that really doesn't gel well with Ubisoft's attempts to write more ethically complex stories about very politically charged topics. Because unlike a normal game where the narrative is bad, this one is a special kind of bad. By highlighting so many ethical questions and political quandaries as core thematic elements to be explored, and then writing such a tone-deaf narrative, the writers here have hopefully unintentionally glorified all of the unspeakably disgusting choices Aiden makes that he pretends he grows from. Fuck Aiden Pierce, and goddamn I'm glad that Watch Dogs 2 is so much less awful in almost every way.